So the passage I want to look at today is in Philippians chapter 2, and I've called this message The Truth About Fear and Trembling. Uh, There was a radio call we received last Sunday, one week ago, and uh, the caller was concerned. There was a person who had become a Christian on the radio program. Maybe some of you heard it. Uh, This person came to receive Christ, and they were a Catholic, and they were they were wanting to know how to become holy. They said, hey, I don't, I'm not holy. I'm unholy. I want to become holy. How do I get holy? And so we went through the, the idea of trying to be holy and how that would turn out. And then we went to the idea of trusting and the difference between trying and trusting. And that the way to become holy is not through trying, but through trusting. This person was primed and ready. I mean, they were ready to really understand the grace of God. They, you know, in their voice even, you could kind of tell they had had their fair share of trying. Uh, and they really wanted to, to try out this idea of trusting. And so anyway, this person prayed to receive Christ on the program and it was something to celebrate. It was awesome. And then the next caller called in. And the next caller said, now, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if that prayer was good enough. And I... I don't, know, I don't know if the attitude was, was, you know, complete enough. I mean, this guy needed to fear the Lord, and that was on his mind. It, you know, the fear of the Lord was not there. And so maybe this guy didn't really have, you know, an authentic conversion, or maybe there's some question about evangelism here, or maybe there's something else that we should have done, or, or whatever it might be. And so it got me thinking about this idea of the fear of the Lord and uh, how we can really take that and and misunderstand it. And there's a lot of misconceptions about the fear of the Lord. Let me say at the outset, the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord. We respect Him. We have reverence and awe for Him. He is our everything. We submit to Him. At the same time, are we as His children supposed to be scared of Him? And at the time that we come to salvation, is it a time to be scared or is it a time to embrace the grace of God? Maybe we've already spent our lives being scared. We spent our lives being scared of death. We spent our lives being scared of the unknown. We spent our lives being scared, trembling about our past and what it might bring us if the great judge were to judge us based on our deeds. And then we come to encounter this grace of God, this message, this gospel about someone who is not us, who has done something for us. And at that time, it should make you just want to go and relax and find the rest that Jesus spoke of. Jesus said, come unto me, all of you who are laboring. You can sense the stress in those words, laboring over their sins, laboring over their lives, Come unto me, all you who labor, and I will give you rest. And so that moment of salvation, when someone comes to grips with what God has done for us, it shouldn't be a time of fear. It should be a time of great comfort and hope and rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So where does this idea that we need to be scared of God come from? Well, uh, of course, Philippians chapter 2 uses this phrase, fear and trembling. And we're going to talk about that today today. Fear and trembling is not what we might think it is. Uh, Fear has many different definitions, doesn't it? When you fear the Lord versus you fear the drunk driver at the street corner who's coming right at you. Uh, There's being scared and then there's being reverent. There's being uh, fearful and then there's being respectful. And those are two very different things. So today we're going to look at Philippians chapter 2, just a string of verses, not all of it. But I have a number of things that have come to mind in this passage as we look at it in context. I want to share those with you this morning. Uh, First, in verse 8 of Philippians 2, it says, Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. There are some out there that will teach that actually God and Jesus were not on the same page. Um, That, you know... If Jesus were to die, then God and Jesus are not on the same page because God is a, a loving God. And, you know, if Jesus were to die, then, then that was just man's plan. And that was just the Roman plan. And that was just the Pharisee plan. 
But what we see here is actually that Jesus' death is in obedience. And then you have to ask, huh, obedience to who? And of course, the obvious implication is obedience to God. And so God and Jesus were on the same page. They had the same agenda. It was a togetherness. In fact, the Bible tells us that before the foundation of the world, the Lamb of God was, was slain. So this was a secret plan before the foundation of the world and just at the right time, and as we're going to see, just in the right way, Jesus was crucified and he died for us. So it wasn't a Roman plan. It wasn't a Pharisee plan. It wasn't, it wasn't a Jewish plan. Uh, you know, I may go into this in the future, in future messages, but this idea that, that you know, well, Jesus didn't really have to die. Um, it was just the culture of his day it had a lot of sacrifice in it. And so God decided to intervene and just sort of relate to their culture. Well, that too is way off base. Before there was any culture, uh, before there were any humans, before the creation of the world itself, God had this planned. And who was it that introduced sacrifice in the Old Testament? God introduced sacrifice in the Old Testament. It wasn't man, it was God. As early as Cain and Abel, there was sacrifice, and one was fitting and one wasn't, and one involved blood and one didn't. Blood sacrifice was God's idea, not ours. And it wasn't something cultural, it was actually something heavenly. We're told, the Lord tells us that what was happening on earth, it was actually a picture of what has happened in heaven. So these are heavenly things. These are earthly copies of heavenly things. My point is, never let someone tell you that the sacrifice of Jesus was optional. Never let someone tell you that the sacrifice of Jesus was not God's plan, but man's. And never let someone tell you that God's ascending of Jesus to die on a cross was not a sacrifice for our sins because, oh, that would be so, so mean. Well, in fact, God is not just a God of love, he's a God of justice, and he set up the blood sacrifice system from the very beginning. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. This was true in the Old Testament, it's also true in the New Testament. The difference is, now there's one sacrifice, not hundreds. There's one sacrifice, not thousands. And so, by one offering, we have been made perfectly cleansed forever. God does have a blood economy. It, blood is required, but thank the Lord that Jesus Christ met that requirement, shedding his perfect blood. And so we see that he humbled himself. He became obedient to the point of death, and that obedience was obviously an obedience to God the Father. They were on the same page with the same plan, even in the garden before it happened, he knew it was coming. It was the plan all the while. Now, the second thing I want to bring up here is, did God die? In other words, did the Trinity cease to exist? Uh, it's very important uh, that we recognize the obvious here. The Trinity did not shut down for three days. Uh, you know, Jesus in his humanity, he experienced a human death with human blood and there was sacrifice and his human body died. His humanity died, but his divinity continued. There is no man on this earth that can snuff out the life of God himself. The Trinity did not shut down for three days. In fact, it was God the Father through the Spirit that raised the Son from the dead to demonstrate his power and victory over death and over sin. Now let's talk about even death on a cross. This is a very important thing because it's a peculiar death. I've highlighted this in the past, but I mean, you know, God could have had Jesus come in the 1960s and he could have been uh, machine gunned down by the mafia, right, in Chicago or something. He could have been gunned down and what would have happened? If that was God's plan, he would have fallen over dead. And that would have been your sacrifice right there. But God chose a very peculiar death. It wasn't a machine gun death. It wasn't a beheading. It was a very peculiar death. It was crucifixion on a cross. And I've highlighted this before because I think it's just pure genius. I think it's genius that God did this because it's one of these, you know, you could, you could take a gun and you could kill yourself. 
Uh, you could probably you could arrange to hang yourself. You could certainly arrange to behead yourself. But there's one thing, there's one death you really can't arrange to do on yourself, and that's crucifixion. It's quite difficult, if not impossible, to crucify yourself. And yet, this is the very verbiage that we find Christians using today. You got to crucify yourself. Have you heard this? You got to crucify yourself. Well, that concept is really not even in the Bible. It says, take up your cross and follow him. And where did he go? He took up his cross and, and went to Calvary, where he was crucified by someone who was not him, an outside force exerted upon him. And when we get saved, that's what we say. My life is nothing apart from you. I am empty. I am dead to God, and I want to be alive to you, God. And so I'm asking, I take up my cross, and I follow you to Calvary, where you crucify me, where you bury me with Jesus, where you raise me to newness of life. You did it to me, and I can't do it to myself. Now, we're not here to just talk about your, your, your birth certificate, your new birth, your birth certificate, and also your death certificate. That's very good. Let's sign off on our death certificate. Let's sign off on our new birth certificate. But the point is, is you're new and you're good to go. You're God's child. You don't need another death. You don't need another killing. You don't need to scrape off part of you. This was a very peculiar death that Jesus died. He became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, a very peculiar death that we cannot do upon ourselves. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Now, what does it mean that God exalted him? Well, the book of Hebrews kind of gives us a little window into this. It says that Jesus, for a little while, was made lower than the angels. Now, you remember that Hebrews also says that Christ is greater than the angels. He is greater in authority and greater in status and greater in position than any angel. But he was made for a little while lower than the angels. And then, just at the right time, God exalted him. And that's what this passage is saying. Now, let's talk about this idea of the name. The name of Jesus is very important the name of Jesus is very powerful. Nonetheless, I know some people that have uh, experienced some guilt over the name of Jesus. They say, well, I, you know, I say the name and I don't feel magical. Uh, I say the name and I don't feel that something amazing has happened. Well, rest assured that the name of Jesus is not a feeling. Uh, you know, you may say the name George Washington. You may say the name Jesus Christ. You may say someone else's name. And you don't feel something in that moment, but we don't, we don't walk by feelings, we walk by faith. And so a lot of people, what I'm saying is they, they accuse themselves uh, in the moments of, you know, we all have ups and downs and we struggle and we have emotions and we, sometimes we feel clean and close and sometimes we feel dirty and distant. And these are emotions. This is the roller coaster of the soul. And so we don't measure our spirituality by what we feel about a name in a given moment. The point is, the name of Jesus is a special name. It is a powerful name. It is the name of the Lord God. It is the name by which we are saved. And that's just a fact, not a feeling. And so some days we may hear a song on the radio, the name of Jesus, and it calls to mind all kinds of wonderful things that he's done for us, and we're in it, and we're in the moment, and we're feeling it, and we're praising God. And then other times we, we go to a church service, and there were four or five songs that morning, and you know we've had a lot going on that week, and we're just like, God, you know, I feel nothing right now. What's wrong with me? Well, the emotions in your soul... They go all over the place. They're not an indicator of your spirit. Do you know that you can be 100% right with God, spiritually right with God, and yet your emotions can be totally wacko? Isn't that amazing? But that's how God created us. Otherwise, there'd be no walk. There'd be no walk of faith. If all of your emotions lined up all the time with your spirit, there would be no walk of faith. But the walk of faith is, hey, despite what is going on right now, despite my inability to feel all the amazing spiritual stuff, I am going to walk by faith in the facts of who Jesus is and who Jesus is to me. The next thing I want to say about this name is it's not only used, but it's abused. 
Um, many times there are some, some streams or flavors of Christian faith that tell us, hey, if you just tack on the name of Jesus, man, it's going to happen for you, right? <laughs> have you heard this? Oh, if you, don't, if you don't have all that health and wealth that you're supposed to have, you're just not using the name. Or when you're using the name, you're not believing right. Or when you're using the name, maybe you've just sort of got a wrong image of God, and so you need to use the name better and claim the name. Hey, that rhymes. Let's go with that. Claim the name, right? And so we start trying to claim the name about everything. And, you know, what's, what's interesting about doing anything in someone's name, um, if I were to do something in, in Stephen's name, or if I were to do something in Jared's name, uh, you know, when I act on their behalf... Uh, it, the idea there, the implication would be that it would be in agreement with their agenda, that it would be in agreement with their heart. And so that's what in Jesus' name means. That's why it says whatever you ask in his name, it, it'll happen for you. I mean, that verse, those passages exist, but the question is, what does is, what is the heart of Jesus want for you? Is it guaranteed health? Is the heart of Jesus guaranteed health with that physical body that you have right now? Well, there'd be no need for another body if that were his agenda. No Christians would die if that were his agenda. Is the heart of Jesus that you have guaranteed wealth? Well, of course not. We can testify to that, right? Amen. Anybody got perfect wealth out there? So what's happening? We're, we're misunderstanding the name of Jesus when we say such things. We're misrepresenting the heart of Jesus Christ. And so what is on the heart of Jesus Christ is that we bear fruit, that we know him, that we know the love of the Father, that we grow in him, grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus, that we give thanks in all things for this is God's will for you. What is God's will? God's will is what it means to act in, in agreement with Jesus' name. So when we get a fleshy agenda going, which we often do, we all do it, right? We get a fleshy agenda going, and then we tack on in Jesus' name, and we're kind of looking up like, huh? What do you think, huh? You think it's going to work, huh? What do you think? Sometimes we even know. Have you ever been praying, and you just get halted? I mean, you're praying, and you're like, wait, 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 wait a minute. This doesn't even sound right to me. Huh? And so you find yourself with a fleshy agenda, and then you've tacked on the magic words in Jesus' name, but your heart is telling you, uh, actually, this may not be God's plan on this one. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. So that the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. You notice that there's three groups. There's basically heaven and then there's earth, and then you could say it's the people in hell or it's the people who are now asleep. They've died. They're buried. At least their bodies were. So I'll let you guys debate on the internet about what that means under the earth. Um, but uh, the point is, is that everybody, I mean, it's high and medium and low and everybody in between, the whole universe, every human that has ever lived is going to bow the knee to Jesus Christ as Lord. And that's whether they like it or not. See, this is not universal salvation. This is whether they like it or not. We get to a point where it kind of becomes obvious when everything fades to black here on planet Earth and we awaken to a surprise. If we're an unbeliever, a tremendous surprise. Everything becomes pretty obvious and it's time to do a little bowing, I would say. Right? So... This is what he's talking about. Every knee will bow. Those who are in heaven already, those who are on earth right now, those who are under the earth. And then he says, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So I love the way this is phrased because, you know, basically it's saying we please the Father when we confess the Son. The Father is just entirely delighted when we honor the Son. That's why he sent the Son. The Son said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father says, if you confess the Son, you please the Father. And so there's this just divine connection. It's the Trinity and there's mystery and it's the identity of God himself, three in one. 
But man, we are not honoring a human. When we confess Jesus as Lord, we please the Father. When we confess the Son, we honor the Father. And that is cool to think about. That's why there's one name. One name above every other name. So, um, you know, do all roads lead to God? Is everyone ultimately saved? Or can you be saved by five names or ten names or any such thing? This, this sort of thought does not please the Father. It's not my... If God wanted it to be that way, that's what I would preach this morning. But God said there's one name under heaven by which we can be saved. And that's what pleases the Father. And so I submit to that. I don't know what you will do. I don't know what people out there will do. But I will choose to submit to that. Won't you? There is one name under the, under, under the Father. There is one name under heaven. There is one name by which we can be saved. All right. So, so then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, this is where people start to go, you know, what am I going to do about this? I thought, you know, I'm supposed to love God and be close to God, and he's my dad, and yet I'm supposed to be scared of God. How do I work this out? Well, let's be very clear at the beginning. I mean, first of all, um, you know, we're told that God's perfect love casts out fear. And then it says, because fear involves punishment. So, What you're fearing, if you're scared of God, you're fearing punishment. And the answer to that is that perfect love casts out the fear, the fear that you've been having, the fear that involves punishment. The solution to that is perfect love. So uh, secondly, we know that, you know, the whole point of the gospel is that we can approach the throne of grace with boldness and confidence to find grace in our time of need, right? So this can't possibly mean that we're supposed to be scared of God. So you do a little digging and you say, what's going on here? Well, Paul used the same phrase when he said he was with the Corinthians. This is Paul, right? you know, he's writing this uh, to the Philippians, but if you flip over to, the, to, to his letter to the Corinthians, he uses the same phrase, not about God, not about being scared of God. He says, I was with you, in fear and trembling, meaning I was with you in reverence and awe. And as we look at the roots of these words and the way they're used, it ultimately means reverence, respect, awe, wow. I mean, doesn't God make you go wow sometimes? I mean, you just wake up and you, you look around at his creation and that's a God that makes you go wow. Um, at night, you know, up in Canada, we were up there for 10 days or so and uh, Two different nights, we had the telescope out, and we were looking at galaxies and uh, just amazing things, uh, lots of different constellations and different stars and um, all kinds of things with this telescope, and, you know, it just, it just makes you go, wow. I mean, it's so much more vast than we can possibly imagine. It's more vast than scientists can, can imagine. They've seen more than we have, and yet they can't imagine. They can't get to the end of it. So, you know, we have a God that makes us go, wow. And then um, when that God lives in you, what does that do to you? I mean, the God that makes you go, wow, and then he comes to reside inside of you. This is what Paul is saying. He's saying, work out your salvation With fear and trembling, look at the next verse. For it is God who is at work within you. It's the wow God. The wow, the awesome, the amazing God. The wow God lives inside of you. And so that's why you would just want to go, are you serious? Are you serious? You've actually done this. You have have given your life for me in order to give your life to me, in order to live your life through me. Wow. Wow. And this just makes you want to have reverence and awe for what he's done. So this is the same phrase that Paul used with the Corinthians. The the next thing I want to highlight here for you is you'll notice that it says work out. Um, It doesn't say work for. It says work out. Big difference. A lot of people are teaching you got to work for your salvation. This implies you've already got it. He's talking to Christians here. 
He's not saying, hey, unbelievers, please work for your salvation. No, he's saying, hey, believers, work out what's already been worked in. Big difference. Do you see it? You've already got the salvation in. You've already got the God who lives in. Now allow him to be worked out. Work out your salvation with reverence and awe. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do or to work for his good pleasure. So you notice, again, we're seeing uh, it's serious business. I mean, that's the theme of it. So grace is serious business. I mean, let's be really serious about grace. See, some people, they, they have sort of a hippie grace. They have a, I don't know what they have. They have a passive grace. They have a grace so behavior doesn't matter. They have a, 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 a kind of a loose hippie style grace. That's not the grace of the Bible. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, you would laugh at that, wouldn't you? I mean, it's just laughable. So the real, the real grace that we have, it actually leads to a seriousness that by the grace of God, I've been equipped. By the grace of God, I've been infused. By the grace of God, the creator of all has stepped down out of heaven and stepped inside of me to live forever. That's by grace, but that's pretty serious. That's by grace, but that deserves respect. And so grace, by grace, we have a very serious thing going on, serious business. And there's two impacts. I want you to see the two impacts here. Number one, because the God of the universe lives in you, he causes you to want. That's number one. He causes you to want. The word there is will. He causes you to will what God wills. He causes you to want what God wants. This is where you go back to the, I don't know, half a dozen teachings I've done this year on the heart of the believer. You know, we used to think we were wicked. We used to think Christians are wicked and dirty and we want to sin and our hearts are no good and woe is me and all of that stuff that sounds so humble. But actually the gospel is getting a new heart and the gospel is getting a new will. The gospel is getting a new want to. So that's what he's saying here. God is at work inside of you to change your want to. And I don't know if you've figured this out yet. Sometimes it takes me a long time. Like I have to, I have to blow up at somebody and then walk away thinking, oh, isn't this going to be satisfying for me to have blown up? And then I'm five seconds in. And then I'm ten seconds in. And then I'm realizing, you know what? This is not working for me. I am actually now going to have to make a total fool of myself and go back and apologize. And as I'm apologizing, I feel more like myself than ever. Uh, and I totally don't feel like myself when I was blowing up. I think it's an outlet. And all it is is a, a beginning. I think it's the end. And then it's actually just the beginning to figuring out, whoa, wait a minute. God of the universe lives in me. He's working in me not to do that, but the other. And so now I have to go back and I have to be at peace with all men, not because it's a law, but it's because it's my heart. And my heart can't get away from the fact that I desire peace and I desire the fruit of the Spirit. And it's like I can't get away from it. Anybody ever experienced that? You thought, you thought the blow-up reaction was the end and it was just the beginning for you. <laughs> yeah? And so, you know, you think, uh, you know, you watch these movies you ever watch a movie where someone's committing this crime or something and you, you try to put yourself in their shoes and you think, man, I, I think, you know, I wonder if I could get away with that. I wonder if I could do that. And then you get down the road of the thoughts of what they've done in the movie and then you're like, you know, I could never, ever, ever do that. Like, how do they even live with themselves? So is that just a conscience? I mean, is that just you with your morality and your conscience? Or is there something deep within you that's fundamentally changed? Is there something within you that causes you to go, whoa, I really am different than I was before? Um, how many of you, you know, have a story in your life? I don't know what it is, but you know what it is. I mean, maybe it was something to you that was big. Uh, or maybe it was just something, you know, small in your eyes, but repetitive. And you thought that maybe you could live with it. And you try to, you know, justify it. You try to be cool with it. You try to be okay with it. 
and yet you just, you just can't be okay with it. Why? Because of this, because of verse 13, that's why. Because we've got the God of the universe living in us, causing us to will what he wills, causing us to want what he wants. So it's not a, it's not a have to, it's not a thou shalt, it's not a look out or else, it's just, it's just a constant. It's like a law of the universe. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has moved in. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus has moved into your heart and he'll never leave you. And so there's a new constant, there's a new normal in our lives and we got to get used to it. And as we, it's like a river, you know, as we swim in agreement with that river, along with the flow and the current, things go a whole lot easier. But you and I both know sometimes we try to turn around and swim upstream And that is some serious work. You know, it's harder work to sin than it is to walk by the Spirit. That's why, interestingly, that's why the verse says the wages of sin is death. How do you get wages? You work for them. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. Do you work for a free gift? No, you work for wages. So sin is hard work. That's what I'm saying. Isn't that amazing? Like, we grew up thinking, oh, sin is the good stuff, sin is tantalizing, sin is fulfilling, but you better not do it. And really, we find out that, oh, I've got a new heart, and sin is actually hard work for me now. Like, I have to go against my heart, I have to go against my nature, I have to go against the Christ who lives in me, I have to go against my whole destiny in order to sin, and then the moment I do, it's like, boo, 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 all hands on deck, something has happened, right? Right? And then we're seeking to repair. So what's going on there? You're trying to swim up current. Walking by the Spirit is the most normal and natural thing for you. Sin is hard work. Exhausting. And there's no payoff. All right. Well, we'll finish with this. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Why? Just so you look good? No. So that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. Let me say this, there's an identity link in in almost every behavior passage, it comes back to your identity. If you don't see it, look a few verses prior. If you don't see it, look at the previous chapter. There is a link between identity and behavior over and over in the New Testament. He's not saying, please behave. He's saying, behave because of who you are. So we don't earn our innocence. I'm going to say this twice. We don't earn our innocence. We prove our innocence. You don't earn your innocence. You're innocent by grace. And then the way you live proves your innocence. Big difference. We don't earn our blamelessness. We prove our blameless heart. Do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove who you are. Who are you? You are children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. That's not very politically correct, is it? A crooked and perverse generation, among whom you, are you crooked and perverse? No, you're a child of God. It says you appear as lights in the world. We don't earn our identity, but we do prove our identity. As we choose to swim with the current, As we choose to walk by the Spirit, we prove that we are totally different than the guy next door. Let's pray together. Father, uh, there may be somebody here, some people here. We all do it. We stumble and fall and we feel like our faith is shipwrecked for a time. And we've been trying to swim up current. We've been trying to make something work. Uh, We try to make something work and it just doesn't work because of your work in us. Uh, Father, we just want to say to you right now that we agree with you that sin doesn't work, that sin is too hard, it's too difficult. Sin is hard work. It goes against our heart and our nature. It goes against you living in us. And Father, we just see that today. We admit it. Uh, We don't want anything to do with it. And um, we thank you for the new way of living, that you've raised us to newness of life. You've raised us to newness of life so that we can swim with the current of your spirit. 
uh, and uh, walk in step with who you are. Father, we thank you for the simple truths of the gospel, that we don't have to be scared. We can approach you with boldness and grace, and we find help, and we find your love in our time of need. We thank you, Father, for your perfect love. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. You guys stand with us. I was a drifter, I had nowhere to go. I was hanging by threads of dust and bone. And every angel I knew was singing, Son, come home. But the melody was hard to sing along. God, you my deliverer. seen. What we saw today is that there is no fear of God the Father. He's our dad. There is no fear in perfect love. Perfect love casts away that fear. Yeah, there's a, a reverence and an awe for God. Jesus Christ is our Lord, but we don't live in fear of God. We do recognize him with reverence and awe. And as we think about what we talked about today, we can approach our Father with boldness and confidence, resting in His perfect love. This is the truth about fear and trembling. Have a great day. Amen.